Well, I've already read the passage this morning, so let's begin to take a look at it. As I've already told you, we are working our way through Luke and uh, wanted to time it so that we would arrive here on, on this particular day as we're thinking about the birth of Jesus. But let me just do a bit of quick review because a lot of um, wonderful things have been taking place leading up to this. Now, remember, so far we've seen the angel's announcement to Zacharias that he and Elizabeth would have a son, that is, John, who was being sent into the world earlier, about six months earlier, to prepare the way for the Lord. And again, we need to remember this one who is coming into the world, this Christ, this Messiah, uh, the anointed one, is not any mere man. He is the Lord in our nature. We've seen the angel announce to Mary that she would conceive and give birth to the Messiah, to the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, that the eternal Son of God would become the Son of Man through her. We've, we've seen Mary's visit to Elizabeth, remember, when John, still yet unborn, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, leaps in her womb for joy at the presence of Jesus. We saw at that moment that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and announced to Mary that she was blessed among women for being singled out for this honor because the child that she was carrying was the Messiah. When uh, at that same time, we saw Mary exalting the Lord for choosing her. Remember, not because she was so great and so wonderful and so mighty, but because she was so humble uh, and unworthy. Uh, Mary was a very godly woman, so were Zacharias and Elizabeth, but for choosing her to bring this one into the world who would save her from her sins as well as all Israel in fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham. We saw the birth of John the Baptist when Zacharias prophesied about God raising up the Messiah, a king from the line of David who would save his people that they might serve him. Again, the idea of service in holiness and righteousness all their days. And then he turns to John while he's still an infant and he says, you child will go before the Messiah, you'll go before Jesus to prepare Israel to receive him. And the way, of course, John would do that would be by preaching the law of God uh, in order to convict them of their sins, to show them their need of the one who was coming, pointing then to the Lord Jesus Christ, whom, if they trusted, would not only be forgiven for their sins of breaking that law, but would be given the power actually to keep that law as the Spirit of God writes it upon their hearts. Now, this morning, Luke continues his account by telling us about the birth of the Messiah. And here in our passage, we see four things, and each has their own peculiar interests, uh, areas of interest. We see these four things, the census that the Lord uses to bring Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. Uh, we see the birth of Jesus, the Christ. And remember, Christ is simply the Greek word for the anointed one, which in Hebrew is Messiah. We see the angelic announcement to the shepherds of the birth of this Messiah, who he was, and we see the shepherds trip to Bethlehem in order to see the fulfillment of this promise. So first of all, we see the census the Lord used to bring Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. Uh, Luke tells us that Caesar Augustus ordered that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. Now, we need to understand that what Augustus meant by this was not the entire world, but rather he meant the whole Roman Empire because by this time it essentially covered the whole civilized world. Now, the purpose of the census was to count the number of people, that's what censuses are for, who were living in each province so that each province would know how much tax money they owed to Rome. So that was Augustus' purpose in bringing about this census. Now Luke points out that this was the first census that was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now if you look at basically the time frames here, we, we see that Quirinius basically was the governor of Cilicia and Syria from 4 BC to 12 AD. 4 B.C., 12 A.D., so you can see the time frame. And Caesar Augustus reigned from 27 B.C. to 14 A.D. Now, we do need to remember that, as I mentioned before, 
the way that people remembered uh, important dates when something important took place in those days, when they wanted to locate it in history, they did it by connecting it to an important event or to somebody who was important that was ruling in order to, uh, you know, how, like during the year of that reign or who was reigning or how long it was since this particular event had taken place. They didn't have a calendar like we do, which is why... Um, you know, they, they had one for the year, but they didn't have one for the years. So things were dated according to events and people. But here's the location. Luke is zeroing in on a particular time frame when this event actually took place. And what he's telling us is that what he has recorded here is not just some myth once upon a time, you know, such and such took place. This isn't a legend. This isn't something that, as Karl Barth said, and, uh, that takes place in supra-history, something that is above history and not rooted in real time and space history, something that happens in the faith of the faithful, something we choose to believe, but something that actually took place, something that really happened. We do need to remember that until recently, history was divided uh, between you know, B.C. and A.D. by this event. B.C. meant, at least in the near past, before Christ. And A.D. meant Anno Domini, or the year of our Lord. You know, when they calibrated the, the time frames of history, uh, they did it by the birth of Jesus Christ, and they believe, of course, that he was born in the year 1 A.D. Actually, we, we know now a little bit more carefully, uh, studying uh, history, that he was born really closer to four to three, and again, when you're on BC, you're going the opposite direction, so if you can say between three and four BC, which falls in, of course, the reigns of Caesar Augustus and Quirinius. So this is something that really happened. This is when it happened. This, again, is a real event. Now, because of the census, we see everyone had to go to their own city in order to register, and Joseph being from the family of David, went to Bethlehem in Judea, which is the city of David, to register along with Mary, to whom he was engaged, who, by the way, was also of the house of David. We're going to see that as we get a little bit further into the Gospel of Luke, and who was with child. Now, as we noted before, Augustus ordered the census for the purposes of taxation, but the Lord ordered it, in order to fulfill the word which he spoke through the prophet Micah, which we read this morning in Micah 5.2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity." It was important in order to fulfill Scripture, in order to fulfill prophecy, what the Lord said. I mean, He can't say something and it not come to pass. Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem. I think you've heard it was noted before. Bethlehem, the word Bethlehem essentially means house of food or house of bread. Out of Bethlehem, out of the house of bread would come the one whom the Lord was giving to the world, the bread of life which comes down from heaven that gives life to the world, who was not only uh, to save Israel, to save everyone who believes in him, but also to rule over Israel and the whole world from that time forward. So here we see the census that brings Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem so that Jesus can be born there. Now, secondly, we see the birth of Jesus Christ. Now that the Lord uh, had uh, them in the right place, it was time for Mary to give birth. And she did to her firstborn son. Now, not a lot is said about this one here, at least in this particular section that we're looking at, but one thing important is noted is the fact that he was firstborn. And of course, Mary being a virgin, it was obvious he would be firstborn, but the fact that he was a firstborn son is significant. This evening, we're going to look at chapter 2, uh, this, this next section here. And one verse, verse 23, Luke is going to point this out. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy 
to the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone else isn't holy, but it means that this is one who is particularly holy to him. To, to be holy means to belong to the Lord. Remember when the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt as the, the last plague before Egypt finally says, get out of here, uh, we've had enough of this. Uh, when the Lord struck down the firstborn of every one of the Egyptians as well as all of their animals, he also claimed all the firstborn sons in Israel to be his. Now later he took the whole tribe of Levi in lieu of these firstborn that they might belong to him in a special way, that they might serve him, serve him in his tabernacle, serve him in his temple. Um, Jesus is holy to the Lord. He's holy in that he is the firstborn. Uh, Jesus is holy in that he is the son of God. That, of course, makes him holy. But he is holy also uh, not just in a relational sense, but also in a moral or spiritual sense because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the virgin. Jesus is holy. I don't think I need to tell you that he is holy. But he is holy in that he was set apart for a particular work that the Lord had for him. And that purpose was to make us holy in our relationship to the Lord. That essentially we would be set apart from this world and set apart to him in order to love him and to serve him. We are also holy in that second moral or spiritual sense. Jesus came into the world to give to us his Holy Spirit so that he might cleanse our hearts by faith, so that he might make us like him, so that we would want to be separate from the world and we would want to serve him in his kingdom. So the Holy One comes into the world in order to make us holy. Now, after he was born, Mary washed him. Mary wrapped him in clean cloths. And by the way, there's nothing special about that. That's what Hebrew women would do when they had children. But the thing to note here is that Mary did it. Okay? Mary did this by herself. There wasn't anybody there to help her. She didn't have a maid. She was poor. Our Lord chooses to work through the poor. That was one of the things that Mary said in her Magnificat. You don't choose the great and mighty, the wealthy, the powerful. You choose the lowly and the humble and the poor. Jesus chooses those who are poor to make them spiritually rich. And you see that shot throughout Scripture. Blessed are the poor because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And then she did something which was interesting. She took him and laid him in a manger. Our Lord's first crib was essentially a feeding trough for some type of you know, barn or stalled animal, right? Again, showing that they were staying in the stall. Now, they weren't staying in the stall because they were poor. They went to the inn. Uh, there was no room in the inn. The census brought too many people. Uh, they were there because of that, but this is significant because this is the sign the angels are going to give to the shepherds. The census brought many people from out of town. The inns were filled before they arrived, and so they're in the main or in the stall, and they lay Jesus in the manger. Now, thirdly, we see the angelic announcement to the shepherds. Uh, in that same area, in that same region, there were shepherds watching over their sheep by night, okay? <laughs> now, one thing that's interesting about this is that there was only a particular time during the year that shepherds would actually pasture their flocks during the night, uh, and that would be from the time of Passover, which was in April, until autumn. It would be, you know, during the, the warmer times of the year, beginning in September. That's when the flocks were pastured in the open fields, which means that Jesus' birth took place within that time frame. I hope I'm not busting anybody's uh, bubble this morning, but he wasn't actually born in, in December. Now, it's interesting, Hippolytus of Rome, who was a believer, a Christian, he appears to be the first one who somehow calculated and suggested that Jesus was born on December the 25th. And Chrysostom, uh, again, silver-tongued preacher of the early church, also agreed with him, upon what grounds I'm not exactly sure. But apparently, they were mistaken. But lest anyone be uh, disillusioned by this, it doesn't really matter when Jesus was born, does it? except that we like to celebrate that day. 
But the Lord has given us a day that, that we should celebrate every week that has to do with Jesus. And that is the Lord's day. That is the day of his resurrection. That's the one he wants us to remember. The important thing to see here, though, is that this birth actually did take place. And it was a special birth. Now, while the shepherds were watching their sheep, suddenly an angel appeared to them. The glory of the Lord, his, his luminous glory surrounded them. And as Zacharias in the temple, remember how he responded when he saw the angel? They responded in the same way. They were terribly frightened. But again, as in the case of Zacharias, the angel did not come to frighten them. He wasn't appearing for judgment, which angels often did. But he tells them, I have come to bring you good news. By the way, good news, what is the gospel? It means good news. So he was coming to tell them the gospel, that it was being fulfilled. God's promise of salvation to all the people of the world, beginning with the Jews, but then also to the Gentiles, was being fulfilled that very night. And so the angel spoke comforting words to them in verses 10 and 11. Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Now, I think they knew something about their sins. They knew something about their need to be redeemed. Certainly the sacrificial system told them about these things. But now here comes the one that these things were all pointing to. The Lord Jesus Christ was being, well, was, was born. Now, the angel also gave them a sign to confirm to them that what he was saying was true. Oftentimes, the Lord would confirm things with a sign. We should take him at his word, but he knows our weakness, and he knows sometimes we need something to buttress our faith, our weak faith, to strengthen it. Well, he gives them a sign here through the angel. In verse 12, he says, you will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. A baby, a baby lying in a feeding trough? Well, that, that's an unusual thing. But this was the sign. Now, again, there's nothing special about the you know, baby being wrapped in claws, but lying in a manger, that would be unique. And that was the evidence that what the angel said was true. As if the angel's appearance wasn't enough, and the sign that he had just given them was not enough, the Lord did one more wonderful thing. He opened up heaven, and a multitude of angels, an angelic choir, appeared with the first angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. The Bible tells us that the angels love to watch the plan of salvation as it's unfolding. They don't know how it all works. God hasn't revealed it all to them. Uh, even the prophets who prophesied of Jesus coming didn't understand everything that was written in their prophecies, but as they see it unfold, they marvel, and here the angels are watching the plan of God unfold, and they begin glorifying him as they see him sending his son into the world to reconcile fallen mankind. Now, finally, we see the shepherds go to Bethlehem in order to see what it is the angel had just told them about. So once the angels had gone back into heaven, the shepherds decided, hey, let's go look for this child that the angel just told us about. And so they did. And they found their way to Mary and to Joseph. And, and the question is, how did they do that? Well, some believe the Holy Spirit guided them. That's possible. I'm sure he did. But we do need to remember one thing. What the prophet Micah said about Bethlehem and how little Bethlehem actually was. It probably wasn't that difficult to find him. Bethlehem uh, wasn't that large a town. Uh, William F. Albright, the archaeologist, estimates that perhaps there was only 300 people living in that area at the time, and that the census perhaps brought maybe another 100 or maybe 200 people in, but a town that small, I mean, how many hotels are you going to find in a town that size? There may have been one. There was no room for them at the inn, not at any of the inns, but at the inn, okay? So there was one inn and one place, and this one inn had one place to house the animals for people who were traveling. So it had one barn uh, with perhaps a couple of stalls. So it wouldn't have been that difficult to find Jesus. So they went to Bethlehem. They found the, the inn. They found the barn. They found the stall, and they saw the child in the stall laying in the manger. 
And they knew then what the angel said was true. Here is the Christ. Here is the Messiah. Here is the Savior. And when they realized that what the angel said was true and what was actually coming to pass, they began to tell others what the angels had said. Now, they, they didn't just tell Joseph and Mary. They appeared to be the only ones that were in that stall. But Luke tells us in verse 18, all who heard it wondered at the things that were told them by the shepherds. We might say the shepherds became the earliest evangelists, you know, to the good news of what they had seen and what they had heard. They wanted to tell other people about it. And those who heard what they had to say were amazed. You know, when you stop and think about it, that's really all the Lord wants us to do. He just wants us to tell other people what it is we have seen and what it is we have heard so that others might come to know Jesus as well. Now, their testimony also served to confirm in Mary's heart what the angel had told her, what Elizabeth had prophesied regarding the child that was in her womb. We read in verse 19 that Mary treasured all these things, which means that she, she as it were, stored them up in her mind. She, she wanted to remember them and not forget, and she pondered them in her heart, which means she kept thinking about what it is that she was hearing. You know, what the Lord said to her, what Elizabeth said to her, what the shepherds are now saying to her, to think about what is it that these things really mean. I mean, even if you're told straightforward, sometimes it's hard to believe. These things are actually coming to pass. So it's probably like a reality check. Is this really happening to me? And yet here's this baby. Is this baby really the one? And, and yeah, well, she believed, yes, but still, what does it all mean? What's going to happen to this child? Well, what it really means is this. God sent his son into the world so that everyone who believes in him will be saved. We all need to be saved. We need to be saved from our sins. We come into this world guilty. We come into this world with a heart that is against God. That's the reason why we behave the way we are. As we heard this morning as we were praying in the back, why we all come into the world as rascals, right? Why we misbehave. It's because we have that kind of a heart. But all of these things that we've done, are our sins, and all these sins, even one sin was enough to condemn us. We've committed many, but God sent his son into the world to save those who believe in him. And understanding the greatness of our debt to a God who is infinitely holy and infinitely worthy, that our sins committed against him are infinite sins, we need to understand there's only one payment that could possibly be made for those sins, and that payment was made by the one who is infinitely worthy, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way to be reconciled to God except through the Lord Jesus. But to be reconciled, we need to trust him. We need to turn away from our sins. Things we're doing that rebellion against him. We need to trust Jesus and his obedience and his death on the cross. We need to look to him for everything that we need to be reconciled to the Father. That's what this tells us. And we should also think, just in closing, uh, what this gift that he has given to us also calls us to do. You know, the Lord didn't come just to save us from our sins. He came to change us. He came to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ so that we would do what Jesus would do. So what does that gift, the gift of his son to us, call us to do? Well, it calls us to return thanks to the Lord for showing us his truth, and it calls us to worship him and to serve him all of our days. Think about what, how the shepherds responded in, in the last verse, in verse 20. Luke tells us, the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen just as had been told them. And I would um, venture to say this was a life-changing event for those shepherds. They probably didn't say, well, that was exciting. What are we going to do tomorrow? But this kept on in their lives from that point forward. And when we see the Lord and we see what it is that God has given to us and we see his beauty and his glory, when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ, it transforms us. God's grace transforms us in order to be like him 
so that we now give our lives to giving him glory, giving him praise, not just with our lips, but with our lives, serving him with all that is within us. So as we think about the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, today, let's purpose to give him that thanksgiving and that praise, that sacrifice of worship, not just today, but every day of our lives from this point to the time we enter into glory where we will worship him forever in heaven. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to uh, help us to do that. And then we'll turn our thoughts to the, uh, the Lord's table that's set before us this morning.